Ladies and gentlemen, dear fleet colleagues, welcome to this Global Fleet webinar. My name is Steven Swoofs. I'm the Chief Editor of Global Fleet and Fleet Europe, and we are really glad that you can join for this webinar on the strategic evolution of captive and non-captive leasing. We are sure that you will appreciate the time and the efforts of our experts in preparing this wonderful session. Why this topic? Well, that's a good question. Historically, there has been a classical split in the strategy of captive and multi-brand leasing companies, as you know, where captive lease companies focus, let's say, more on the B2C market, on private clients, and multi-brand leasing companies are targeting more the B2B clients and for sure the international and the bigger fleets that we have in Europe. But this classical situation is somehow changing and lease companies seek to expand the services and business horizon influenced by economy, urbanization, taxation and regulation, internationalization, the need for cost efficiency and of course scalability. The result is the search for new clients and also new business success with the development of new services and streamlined products for a wider target group. So in brief, we are facing an exciting evolution in the car lease industry. And so there are new strategies that are developed, and that's why we believe that it's an important moment to stand still with the evolution of captive and non-captive leasing. The program for this session is built up around two expert speakers. First, I will give the webinar floor to Mr. Robert Boscari. He is our global fleet expert, and he will introduce current and future strategy of today's leasing companies, taking into account some key market conditions. Afterwards, Mr. Wim Bowens, he is responsible for sales and marketing at Sofico. He will present his view on the future of car leasing, discussing the possible impact of some upcoming trends that are really interesting for our fleet management. And finally, there will be time for you to ask any question you'd like to both our expert speakers involved in this webinar, as we will organize a Q&A at the end of the webinar, and you can ask your question via the chat function in your webinar tool. So let me now introduce our first expert speaker, it's Mr. Robert Boscari, and he will give you some ideas about the upcoming strategy of captive and non-captive leasing companies. Robert, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem for that. So, I can are you ready you. to give your view, Robert? Sure, I'm ready. Ready okay. to go. So, Perfect. thank you, Stephen. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. So my presentation today is uh, focused on the situation of the car makers captives and the B2B market with two questions. Is it for them an increasing trend towards the B2B market? If yes, what could be the impact for the market, for the actors and for the clients? So, is it for them an increasing trend towards the B2B market? On the next slide, the first step in the answer is that B2B market in Europe is well known by car makers captives. They have indeed a strong activity in financial leasing in Europe. Just an example. The German market is for a long time a high potential market for financial leasing. In long-term rental, it's true that the car makers captives volumes dropped with the 2008 crisis, especially because of residual values strong depreciation. So they started at that moment partnerships with major independent long-term rental companies with white label lease products. If you see now 
the 2014 Lease Europe ranking on lease plus uh, rent, you can see that uh, Volkswagen leasing is number one, with more than 500,000 cars just for one year. BNP Paribas is number two. Société Générale number six, uh, number three, excuse me, and Renault Kelly International is number six. So the answer one is that uh, car makers captives have a real experience on B2B offers in Europe, all brands. On the next slide, the second step is uh, that B2B market without short-term rental sales continues its growing trend. If we see the current trend, despite the China's market slows down, there is still a positive trend of plus 3% in 2015. Despite South America and Russia fleet market drop, we see a strong increase in Europe plus 9% for 2015 trend after 2014 at 16%. What about the current fleet sales share in total manufacturers sales? 18% of the total worldwide sales and 32% in Europe. So fleet market, which is a strong market in Europe, is becoming a significant worldwide market. The third example I took uh, concerned the 2014 fleet sales ranking in Europe. UK market is number one with 1,096,000 vehicles plus 28% versus 2013. You know that fleet market in UK is one of the most important in the world after Chinese and US one. German market is number two with 857,000 plus 9 percent and France number three 728,000 plus 10 percent. So the answer to is that B2B market development is taking a significant share of OEM's total sales. One third of European sales, 20% of worldwide sales. Despite a low level, uh, a low level of uh, China's market, fleet market, with about 10% share of the total China's market. Next slide. The Third step I have chosen is manufacturers and captive situation is changing. Car makers operating margin rate increased in Europe. Car makers have invested a lot in used car market. They have invested on labels, network processes, remarketing, and residual value approaches. That is for me a decisive point for a good economic approach of fleet markets. And captives have today the intelligence on the reserve value. They have also invested a lot in after sales, services, IT developments for fleet clients. We must also consider the car's technological evolution with telematic and connected vehicles, which opens up new services possibility for the management of the fleet, for drivers' behavior, safety, security, and mobility management. New offers around connected cars and car as a service concepts. To embed this offer, Long-term rental or fleet management are for me the best product support. It is also for car makers the possibility to make operating margin in services around the car. You know that car operating margin 
is lower in the fleet market than for retail, for example. In addition, long-term rental or fleet management develops client loyalty. So the answer three is that in a more positive context in Europe and due to their investments in new cars after sales, services and technological car evolution, the OEMs and their captives must develop operational leasing in the B2B market. On the next slide, we will see what could be the impact on the market, the actors and the clients. On market level, two client types, small and medium fleets and key accounts. Small and medium fleets is and would be the priority for car makers captives. Thanks to dealer network, this long-term rental market segment will increase and it is a direct impact. To have this offer or not to have could be decisive for clients brand choice in this segment in the near future. On key account market segment, it is a mature market in Europe and North America. But we could think about a market segment increase outside Europe and for national protocols too. When the tenders are focused on one car maker with its brands, it is a direct impact too. The impact on the actors. Two types of players the long-term rental and fleet management independent companies and the OEMs captives. On long-term rental and fleet management independent companies, I think that volume risk is low for the majors. They will go to seek new opportunities on small fleets, even on retail market, by using their banking network, even on mobility management, on car cash allowances, market, etc. Their volume will drop on white label lease. Maybe a volume risk for long-term rental local actors, but not for major. It's my opinion. What about the OEM captives? They could have an innovative role in new connected car services because the captives could be integrated from the start of the OEM's development projects. Captives are monobrand, but they can propose all the brand of the OEM's group or alliance. So they could be able to answer to national or some international tenders. But what is sure in the short term is that it is an impact on national protocols and also standards in the countries in which the OEMs have a strong market position. The impact on the clients, firstly on small and medium fleet segment, the wider offers for them on telematic and connected cars area, which is very positive for dealer networks with a more comprehensive offer of solutions and services and to enhance the one-stop shopping concept. On key accounts, in my opinion, they are the winner of that. Not because they will change supplier, but they will take the full benefits of uh, technological evolution and wider offers. Car makers always take into account their needs. This is the end the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your comprehensive insight into the strategy of captive leasing companies and also touching on the non-captives. Um,
I said before, and also mentioned by Robert, so we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question for our experts, please submit your question using the chat function of the webinar tool in order that we can select the most interesting questions for our experts during the Q&A. Now, let's go to our second expert speaker for this webinar. It's Mr. Wim Bowens uh, from Sofico. Wim uh, is responsible for sales and marketing, and he will take a look, let's say, a little bit into the future and present some trends that could have an impact on the car lease equation in Europe in the years to come. So, Wim, the webinar floor is yours. Can you hear me, Wim? Yep. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, yes. So, as Stephen said, let's uh, have a little look into the future. Um, what we are seeing today is that uh, the market is changing, and the market is always changing. And I think Robert just gave a very good summary of some of the changes that are happening where fleet and retail seem to be converging towards each other. Um, what also happens in the market is that there is always going to be some mergers and acquisitions taking place. New products get tested and launched and some are around to stay and some disappear again. The legal framework is something which is uh, never sure uh, with new governments uh, coming in after elections. They can change the rules and the regulations and compliance can change. And of course there is always the final uh, consumer who has uh, changing buyer behavior, changing preferences uh, through various pressures from, from society as a whole or from the, the lawmakers. Um, so there's a lot of changes and if you look um, on the last couple of years, a lot of those changes that we have seen really uh, coming through into the market, into the products that are being offered to the fleet managers, uh, the focus has been on mobility and on e-vehicles and on green technology. So you have the guy that traditionally drives his company car on top and until a few years ago this is pretty much uh, how the business worked. We dealt with getting that guy into that car or that, that woman into that car. Uh, and today there's quite a few products already available in quite a few markets around Europe and the rest of the world that are more about short-term rental as a, a possible replacement of some of your trips about uh, car sharing, corporate car sharing, uh, mobility services where you might be able to use a train and then a bicycle or a scooter or an electric scooter for, for some of the, the, the travel you have to do. Um, so the last few years we have seen a bit of a focus on that. What I would like to do today is have a, a small look ahead into the near future, although I have to warn everybody that I don't really have a crystal ball where I can see the future. It's always dangerous to do any prediction about the future. But I think based on how we see the market moving now and some of the possible influences on the market that could happen in the future, um, there, there is some reasonable guessing that you could do. Uh, so what I would like to do today is sort of present to you a product which is, I think at the moment, fairly unknown within Europe and uh, within most of the world, but which has had quite a big success in some isolated markets. And I think this product might break out of those isolated markets in the future. Um, if we look at the product itself, uh, it is something which is very common in Australia. It's called Novated Lease, and um, I'm not a native English speaker, and to me the, the word Novated Lease doesn't mean much, uh, but to novate is to replace by something new. Um, so that doesn't really help. I think if it does come to Europe, it will have to be under a different name. But first let me explain the product. Uh, it starts, of course, with the employee, with the person that would traditionally get either a leasing car or a mobility budget available. This person in this product setup will sign a contract directly with the leasing company. So they take out a lease and they sign a contract themselves as their own person privately with the leasing company. Um, what is then uh, a bit special is that you get a third party involved, which is the employer. So the leasing company has signed the agreement with the employee, but they will invoice to the employer um, because the three of them will sign a contract that allows them to do that. And the employer in turn will then um, deduct the leasing cost out of the pretax income of the employee. So it is in effect a sort of salary sacrifice scheme 
whereby um, you get paid um, or you pay the leasing cost of your contract, not yourself, but your employer does it for you out of your pre-tax income. Now, there's a number of benefits to this sort of uh, setup uh, that we see for all the parties involved, really. Um, if we look at the employee, there is a significant tax benefit. This will depend on the local tax regulations, but um, if you sacrifice some of your salary, your salary will be lower and you probably will be paying less taxes on it. Of course, as a private person, you also then get access or you can leverage the leasing company's buying power and the discounts that they can get. You also have a f greater flexibility in car choice than you would normally have with a traditional uh, company car. The company can dictate through their car policy what kind of model you can have of car or what type of vehicle you can get. They can tell you which options you are allowed to take or not allowed to take. If you sign your own company, uh, your own uh, contract with the leasing company, you pretty much decide how you want that to look, what type of car, what type of options, um, the length of the car and the mileage included. Uh, as an employee, as a private person, you then also get access to the hassle-free motoring that you get of all the included services in an operational lease. You don't have to look for your own insurance. You have roadside assistance if you include all these extra services in the contract. Um, you have replacement car. You have uh, winter tires, uh, depending on how you set up the contract. But you do get access to all these extra services that you would have to pay separate if you just bought your car privately. And then, of course, the last thing is that the vehicle stays with you. Um, there's two sides to the medal here. Uh, if you decide to leave your current employer or you get fired, that means that you become responsible for the payments at that point, uh, which could be inconvenient if you're out of a job. But on the other hand, you do keep the vehicle. So if you need to go out looking for a new job, you do have a vehicle to get around. And typical uh, in Australia, where uh, this is a common product, your new employer will then uh, sign into this contract. So they then will start taking the payments out of your um, take home salary again. So you can shift it from one employer to the other. Of course, for the leasing company, uh, the benefit is, is fairly simple. They have a bigger market. There is more potential uh, people that they can reach their products with. And if you look on the employer side, um, to them it's very beneficial because they can now offer a car as an incentive to all of their staff, whereas traditionally it's either people that have to drive a lot for their job that get a car, or you get a perk car as part of your salary. But now they can offer this to just about all the employees, really. And they can also offer individual employees a salary increase by adding this car uh, scheme to their salary benefit package at no uh, little extra cost to them. They will also have uh, no fleet management to do. They do have to handle all the administration of the payment, but the actual fleet management uh, no longer resides with them. Uh, all of the well, not company cars, but what would normally have been company cars if they become employee cars under this product. Uh, all these cars would go off balance sheet. And of course, as I mentioned before, the vehicle stays with the employee. So you no longer have the situation where, as an employer, if the employee leaves the company, you are left with one car in the parking lot that you are paying for, but that is not actually being driven um, and that you have to deal with. So this is uh, how the product works and how it benefits everybody. Um, as I mentioned before, there is no crystal ball, but there is a number of reasons why I think that outside of Australia uh, and New Zealand, where this is a common product, we could also start seeing some variation of this product in the future. There is a number of trends that uh, I observe that I think kind of match some of the benefits of this product. The first trend is, um, I think, pretty much covered by Robert in the first part of this uh, webinar. There is a convergence going on in the market of retail and fleet. So the traditional product boundaries are blurring. If you look at some markets, like for example the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, there is now private lease products that are existing where the fleet companies are directly offering a leasing product to private people. So this kind of product already exists where you as a private person sign a contract with a lease company. The next step would then just be that your employee gets involved and that it comes out of your uh, income. Um, and this is sort of the, the second trend that um, we see in the market. 
That is that there's a number of mobility products being offered today that change the relationship between the lease company and uh, their customers. Traditionally, you have a lease company on the left who is offering cars or mobility services uh, today. And you have the company on the right who needs mobility services or cars for their uh, company employees. And you have a strictly B2B relationship. What you see with the mobility products that are being offered is that the lease company kind of has to reach the employee of the, the, the customer company. So you're more in a business to business to consumer or a business to business to employee relationship where the person that is actually making the placement from A to B gets to decide how they do that placement, whether it is with a train and a, a bike or a taxi on the other end or with a company pool car or uh, whatever it may be they kind of decide how they use their mobility budget if they get that. So it's not a big leap to go from this relationship into a sort of triangular setup as we just saw it uh, for this product where you have the three parties involved and the user chooser then chooses his car that he likes, he signs it with the lease company and then all the invoicing and the payments is handled in a triangle construction between the three parties. And then last of all, there's a third trend. Um, mentioned before, there was always changes to regulations and taxations, and these can either completely uh, break the demand for a product, or they can create demand for new products. I think anybody involved in the UK market, uh, I think up until 10 years ago, uh, payment protection insurance was quite commonly sold there, and then the laws changed, and you had to disclose uh, where the monthly payments were going, and the that product was dead in the market. So there can be big changes that can have a big influence. Um, if we look at, for example, IFRS, which is still looming on the horizon, uh, when it gets finalized and takes effect, if uh, this means that a company with a significant fleet of cars will have to bring those cars on the balance sheet, this could lead to cars getting rid of their fleet. Uh, at that point, a product like I just explained, where the actual employees take the, the leasing contract directly, could be a big help in the market uh, to maintain those fleets in a different way. But this is, of course, to be seen. One uh, question that one could ask is whether it is possible to take a product that is successful in one market and just transplant it into another market. Well, I think um, you, you probably can to some extent. Every market is, of course, different. Uh, the rules and regulations and the taxation is different in every market and if you look at Europe it's quite a fragmented patchwork of rules and regulations and taxations. So you would have to look on a country per country individual basis but uh, I have experience in the past at a, at a captive finance companies at their European marketing team and I do know that 10 years ago for example our colleagues in Sweden at that time experimented with this type of product uh, and they did a pilot with quite great success. Uh, the reason why this product is not now commonly available in Sweden is that 10 years ago nobody knew this product, so they, uh, they took a lot of effort selling the product. They had to go to a company, explain what this type of product could do. If the company thought it was interesting, they could then bring in the, the leasing, the captive company representative to explain it to all the staff. And then once everybody understood it, there was quite a good uptake on the product. But it was still a lot more effort to sell and a bigger cost per contract than just selling through the dealership. So this is why it hasn't happened. But with some changes to regulation, to customer preferences, and so on, um, if the environment is right, I think this product could really work in, in any of the mature markets in the world. This kind of brings me to the end of uh, my part of the webinar. Um, I think Stephen now will open the floor to some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wim. Thank you for your expertise. Um, yes, we already received uh, some questions. So also to the participants uh, that didn't uh, send their question for the experts yet, you can do so by using uh, the chat function uh, in your webinar tool as we are now moving on to the final part of this webinar. Um, perhaps uh, first to start again with Wim. Uh, it's, of course, related to uh, the concept that you presented, let's say the novated lease. Um, the question is, can you explain once again the true benefits of novated lease as opposed to conventional leasing which is more a B2B model. So there is someone who wants to know really, um, but why not go then also for the other, let's say, employees, I think, 
in a more traditional leasing concept. What is the true advantage of the concept that you presented? Uh, perhaps I will take the slide with the advantage yeah. on it so that you can follow. Okay. So for the employee, there's a number of advantages, uh, mainly around uh, their their taxes. So you, because you do a, sac a salary sacrifice, you lower your overall income and you typically get less taxes. You will be taxed on a benefit in kind, um, but typically you will save money as an employee. On top of having access to a number of things that you wouldn't have if you um, get the car yourself or that you wouldn't have if you get a traditional operating lease from your employer. Uh, the fact that you have a greater flexibility, you're not within the restrictions of a car policy, for example. The fact that the car stays with you uh, if you move around from one company to another. Uh, so those are the benefits that you get. And for the employer, um, if you have a fleet of 90 cars to manage and all of a sudden these uh, are signed by the employees themselves, you basically get rid of your whole overhead on the fleet. There is some overhead on, on managing the payments uh, of the salary sacrifice scheme then, of the, the product, but um, I think that that wouldn't be offset by each other. You still would save some money there because you don't have the fleet to manage. And it takes your whole fleet off your balance sheet because you are only handling payments for a contract of somebody else. You don't have a contract yourself anymore. Okay, that is clear. Um, second question related to this topic is um, you mentioned when that one of the advantages can be because you sign a contract, let's say, as an employee with a leasing company, that when you leave the company that you keep the responsibility over the contract and the car and that you take the car with you to the mm -hmm. new company. So the question is, and what happens then when an employee leaves a company without having a new employer? Yeah, and in the intermediate, you are personally responsible for that car and okay. for the payment by yourself. Okay. Perfect. Um, a third question related to what you presented uh, is, do you know which kind of leasing companies offer those kind of services already in Europe? Is it, for example, are there just a few leasing companies? Is it already on the market? Are there the main leasing companies that offer that or that want to go into that direction? What do you think, Ben? Uh, I think at the moment that nobody is really offering this product yet. Uh, even though we have a number of quite mature markets with sophisticated products, this, this is quite a, a complicated setup. So you have to really sell it uh, intensively to make sure people understand it and understand the benefits. And they will vary from country to country how the taxation of cars benefit in kind and the income taxation is. Uh, so I don't think at the moment it exists here. Um, we know it, Sofico, uh, because we have an office in Australia and we do some projects there. And it's just our opinion that there is a number of things in the concept that could work in Europe. But I haven't really seen it here, unless I am mistaken, of course. Okay. There is uh, one of the participants who is just mentioning that apparently in Germany um, there is a company, AMS, who also offers already that product. But, uh, okay. So I think it's, uh, let's say, quite limited at the moment here in Europe, but who knows that also after this webinar that there are leasing companies who will uh, try to develop uh, this product uh, into their portfolio. Um, an additional question, uh, no, a question for Robert uh, about the captives and non-captives. Uh, the question is related to the fact that key accounts, big, large international fleets, are predominantly uh, using, let's say, the services, the leasing services of the major independent uh, leasing companies, so not the captives. And the question uh, related to that is, do you really believe that captive leasing companies can play a more predominant role for these big international customers and what needs to happen to enable this yes um, yeah okay um, firstly uh, it is important to note that a uh, small and medium fleet will stay a priority for car makers captives but uh, if they have opportunities and ability 
work with large accounts, I think they will do. I see some uh, opportunities for the captive and for uh, the clients. On uh, national tenders on first, in uh, countries in which uh, car makers have a strong market position. Uh, after that, on sole source tenders, even dual, if they are able to propose many brands and a complete wide range of uh, vehicles. Also on uh, LCV tenders, they have the expertise of, uh, for vehicle adaptations. Uh, the OEMs often have dedicated LCVs network, so it is an advantage uh, for at after sales, for services, and sometimes for remarketing. On international tenders, for me, is depending on the captive country coverage, uh, vehicle range or brands coverage. But in my opinion, uh, in any case, uh, international, uh, international fleet manager can add into tenders, uh, what can I say, service level agreements, and if necessary, in this context, integrate car makers captive services. As I have already said, uh, with a wider services offer, international fleet managers will be the winner of that. They will take benefits from it. When you see the, what can I say, the asset of each actors, the multi-brand lease company asset is the capacity on the company on managing costs and services diversity. On the other side, car makers' captive asset is the expertise to on managing car makers' cars and services. Uh, as I said just before, for international fleet, the main issue and concerns are countries' services and vehicle range coverage. So, if an international call for tender is focused on one car maker with its brands, its alliance brands, and if the captive is able to propose a high quality offer in the countries, the captive can compete. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think that on the uh, international fleet market, uh, the international fleet manager, they know the respective roles and uh, of each, and uh, they are clearly defined, and international fleet manager uh, will make the appropriate choice of me, of, uh, for me. So uh, that's my answer to that to your mm. question. Okay. Um, to have a follow-up question, Robert, um, do you believe, for example, that uh, captive leasing companies, so depending, let's say, on uh, common manufacturer groups? Um, that they perhaps have a strategic advantage to uh, launch, let's say, leasing services in uh, less mature emerging markets where they can use their presence that they already have as a brand also for now funding and financing services. Could that be some kind of angle where non-captives can also be of interest for bigger fleets? I think that uh, for the captives, they will stay inside the, the mature countries. Because uh, fleet and mobility management need a complex approach with uh, services diversity. Um, client and network platform and back office services. So uh, IT investment is not enough. They have to ensure uh, specialist human investment. Uh, the key account fleet management often needs dedicated teams. Uh, I think it will take time to deploy and make uh, this investment profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that car makers captives will deploy as a priority when there, uh, there is a volume potential. Uh, example, the country of origin and, and uh, high volume markets, the priority will, for them will stay small and medium fleet. Uh, on the 
the independent major companies, I think they are help. They cover a lot of countries with a um, constant level of quality. They have a sufficient critical mass to invest. And uh, they know perfectly international protocol. So uh, it is at services offer level that car makers captive have a structural advantage. Uh, and for me, one of the most important is a new service innovation thanks to um, telematic and mm. connected cars. Okay, that's clear. Thank you very much for your insight, Robert. We have uh, other questions uh, for Wim. Wim, mm -hmm. um, we talked about new, let's say, lease concepts. Uh, based on the novated lease that perhaps we can also see popping up in Europe. We talked about uh, the strategic evolution of captives and non-captive le leasing companies. Now, uh, there is, let's say, some doubt, some uh, skepticism about uh, the performance in back office services and client follow-up that is needed when you uh, change your focus, let's say, from small and medium private retail clients towards international, big multinational fleets that have, let's say, other requirements and demands. So will it not take quite a long while before that captives can really manage the complexity that is purely, or let's say, that is typical for a big international fleet. How do you see that? It, it's true that you you need a very performant back office system to handle um, these type of operating lease product and the services, so you can follow up and manage properly these big key accounts. Um, and I think at the moment, as a captive, the systems they have, the legacy systems. Uh, are focused on higher volumes and operational efficiency at these higher volumes, but they will struggle with all managing all the extra services that come with an operating lease. So I think um, the the solution is you have to have one back office system that can handle all these type of contracts. If you duplicate and you have a second office back office system for these new type of products that you start offering as a, as a captive, then you will have duplication, which can lead to a lot of trouble. So I think uh, as soon as you can um, implement these new products into your back office system in a good way, um, you can offer the right quality of services. Um, and I think it's easier to take your um, fleet management system that has all these capabilities and then try to scale that up so it becomes operationally efficient and then handle your whole portfolio of both retail and fleet on such a system then do it the other way around and trying to adding these services to your current retail system. Um, so I think there is definitely for all these uh, companies some big investments that will have to be made to assure that they can deliver the level of quality that the customers are used to. Okay, really good. Um, Another question for you, Wim, is related to um, the possible new lease concept that you explained. And uh, the topic is around, let's say, liability. Um, let's say the question is, is there a joint liability between the employer and the leasing company? Um, how does it work, for example, to assure that um, if you have your employees that are working for you, but they have a direct contract with a leasing company um, and they move around on an international level or uh, they, yes, how do you, how can you assure that the, mm, mm, to manage them from a risk point of view, from a credit point of view, et cetera, et cetera, that that will be okay? Um. That's a good question, <laughs> which goes into a bit more detail than the, the high-level overview of the product. And because I haven't been involved in uh, Australian products directly, I wouldn't really know off the top of my head how it is handled on that level of detail. Although a number of my colleagues who are in the building uh, would be able to, to handle that or to, to tell you that. Uh, so at the moment, I couldn't give you a, a real insight into it, how it's uh, finally handled from a risk perspective for those kind of customers, I'm afraid. Okay, but that's no problem. I think that perhaps after the webinar we can uh, try to uh, 
come up with some advice and then we can post that yeah. also with the recorded version of the webinar for our community so that there is some yeah. more insight. Yeah, so that happy. can be an idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question, uh, perhaps starting with you, Win, is um, what is your, if you are an international fleet and you're working with, let's say, preferred lease partners and now you have uh, watched the Global Fleet webinar and you are a little bit hesitating, do I need to change? Is it perhaps time that I also get some captives involved? And uh, what is your tip, let's say, what is your main advice for those kind of fleets that are a little bit uh, hesitating what they should do working with or not working with captive lease companies or multi-brand lease companies? Um, I think the, the important thing as, as a fleet manager is that uh, hopefully through today or through other means you, you are aware or you'll become aware that uh, your choice of suppliers may have increased in the last few years um, and you need to be aware of that. Uh, so maybe you don't need to go out tomorrow and look for a new supplier but I think everybody uh, as a fleet manager reviews their uh, suppliers and has a look at how competitive the supplier is at a regular interval and I think the next time that exercise takes place it's important to maybe include some other players that you might not have thought of as potential suppliers in the past and see how they compare. Good. Um, final word is for Robert. Also for you Robert, uh, can you yeah. give your insight, your advice when it comes let's say to fleets that are perhaps questioning what should I do, should I continue with my current leasing partners or can I let's say extend a little bit my scope and also look if it's possible to go to captives or non-captives that I will include in my uh, approach. What is your advice? My advice is uh, do what you think to do because uh, I think that uh, it's um, one approach which is uh, I think on the innovative role on the on the captives with uh, connectivity and uh, mobility, I think they will have this uh, this role because um, connectivity and mobility will speed up the development of uh, these products and uh, long term rental and fleet management, etc. So um, with Connectivity, you open vehicle windows and the driver is connected to his personal and professional environment, to his safety. With uh, mobility, you open vehicle doors and the driver manages his personal and professional movement and travels, security and so on. So many innovative services can be created around vehicle for its use and I think that uh, the captives are, uh, will be the the innovative uh, will have an innovative role on that. And that's my uh, only, the only uh, advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We have come to the end of this Global Fleet webinar. We want to thank our experts, Wim Bowens and Robert Boscari. We also want to thank Sofico for their support. There will be a recorded version of this webinar uh, that we will put online at globalfleet.com in the upcoming days and uh, please spare also a few minutes of your time to answer our satisfaction survey with regard to this Global Fleet webinar as we want of course always to hear your feedback and see where we can optimize an upcoming webinar. I thank you very much for uh, your participation and I hope you have a great afternoon and I'm pleased to welcome you at a future initiative of Global Fleet. Thank you. Bye-bye.